Thirty-one, time. In a poem which very early expressed the existential spirit, Trumbull Stickney, eighteen seventy-four to nineteen o four, declared, "Live blindly and upon the hour. The Lord, who was the future, died full long ago. Knowledge which is the past is folly. Go, give thyself to the lovely hours, drinking their lips." Thou art divine. Thou livest. Stickney's point was a very simple one. Since God is supposedly dead, the knowledge is folly, and the future died with God. Man is now his own God, and he has only the present hour as a certainty. Man should therefore seek passionately whatever he desires. And gratify himself blindly without any thoughts of the future. If man has no future but only a fleeting present, then whatever he wants requires instant gratification. There can be no waiting, nor any patience. Instant gratification means revolution. Not surprisingly, criminals in the twentieth century have come to be regarded by some as revolutionary heroes. Some of this is exploitation of criminals and their cause by the revolutionists, but the exploitation is possible because there is a ready sympathy for criminals among many peoples. The criminal lives usually in terms of instant gratification, and he thus appeals to the people who share his temperament. There is thus sympathy for, and a kinship with criminals on the part of existential humanists. A society demanding instant gratification is a society which denies the necessity of growth. Growth means development, readiness, and maturity. It means that a child cannot expect the privileges of maturity, but must grow into them. It means that a mature person recognizes that many goals require years of work, and that many, if not virtually all, social objectives cannot be realized in a man's lifetime. The mature person lives and builds for himself and for yet unborn generations. Instead of living blindly and upon the hour, he builds today on a past inheritance. Towards a future goal, the goal of Stickney's fellow humanists is a graveyard society, whether they admit it or not. Marx wanted a communist society in which a man could realize himself in every area immediately. In Marx's dream society, a man could do as he pleased all day and with competence in every area. His dream world is a static society, an unchanging communist utopia. A changing society requires a developing order, not a final one. In a developing society, instant gratification is not possible, because all things have not been brought to a final, gratifying state of perfection to enable man to have instant paradise at every turn. Marx was more naive and more open than most humanists, who also dream of the unchanging instant gratification society, but are less honest about confessing it. Engels, in anti During, held a position similar to Marx. He predicted that communism would render all experts and specialists unnecessary. As Clark quite rightly asked. I wonder who will perform brain surgery. Like Marx, Engels believed in an unchanging society in which potentiality and actuality are one. An unchanging society in time is, however, a graveyard society, because life in time means growth, development, experience, and a future. For this reason, the new creation is described by the word "kainos," not "neos." It is ever new in quality and in opportunity, while not new in time. 
It is thus very much unlike the stagnant society of Marx and Stickney, those who, after Stickney, try to live blindly and upon the hour, soon find the hour appalling and suicide attractive. According to Mumford, the desire to escape from time was basic to the appeal of the new world to humanistic man after the 15th century. It was an attempt to escape time and the cumulative effects of time, tradition and history by changing it for unoccupied space. Men sought to escape from their problems and history by imagining that the new world would allow man to become a new man. It was to be a return to Eden, and the Indians were sometimes portrayed as unfallen Adamites. However, the new world quickly became an area where the old man revealed himself in all his sin, and only in the areas where Christ's new men, the Puritans, established themselves, did the new world truly become new. Today, there is no less a desire for the old man to escape his old world of guilt, sin and death. Philosophically, existentialism is his means of attempting an escape. He tries to live blindly and upon the hour as a way of avoiding God in the future, and he substitutes change for growth as an alternative to responsibility. Physically, man tries to escape from time by exploring space. Mumford has noted that to justify space travel, its exponents must brazenly vilify earthly life. Much has been made in both the popular press as well as in scientific reports of Einstein's theorising that a man could take a space journey lasting centuries and return to Earth only slightly older. Popular imagination and science fiction have played with the idea as a means of escaping time. To escape from time means to humanistic man to escape from history and judgment. It means evading the consequences of sin and the day of reckoning. It means also eluding death and avoiding ageing. For many people, the landing on the moon meant psychologically we have done this and now nothing is impossible for man. Arthur Clarke has said, The dullards may remain on placid earth and real genius will flourish only in space, the realm of the machine, not of flesh and blood. Mumford sees space exploration as satanic, declaring, The actual genius that will flourish only in space, in the realm of the machine, is a genius of entropy and anti-life. With space exploration, the traditional enemy of God and man has already reappeared in post-Faustian form. And, as of old, if one is willing to sell one's soul to him, he offers his ancient bribe, unlimited power of control, control absolute, not only over all other kingdoms and principalities, but over life itself. In ancient paganism, and in some areas still, humanistic man sought to govern time by means of rites whose purpose was to control time and nature. In fertility and chaos cults, men believed that they could make nature fruitful again, wipe out past history and sins, reverse time and order, and regenerate themselves, nature and history. Pagan man had a poor sense of time, because time was something his acts and rights supposedly rendered meaningless. Some scholars speak of pagan man's view as sacred time, and every year as a year of salvation. This is true in a sense other than Gerardus van der Leeu and Mircea Eliade intended. Pagan man, in effect his own god, fructifier of nature and self-atoner, made time sacred by his acts. Nature and its cycles were holy. And man, as the high point of nature, was the lord and priest of the holy. It was a power for him to manipulate and use with caution, but still his to use. For this reason, Paul at Athens proved offensive to the pagan philosophers. 
he declared, among other things, that God had determined the times before appointed, Acts 17.26, and that he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he raised him from the dead, Acts 17.31. Time thus was not in man's power, but an aspect of the creation of an absolute God. Time thus moved in terms of God's purpose and plan, and brought all men to his sovereign judgment seat. This, to the philosophers, was not acceptable. The pagan calendar had a nature cycle. The festivals and events which governed the calendar were natural events. The equinox, the solstice, the death of vegetation, the birth of vegetation, and so on. The government of time was thus within time, from nature and man. The Christian calendar was the antithesis of all this. Every year is the year of our Lord. Time and the universe are his creation. Time and the cosmos are thus governed from before and beyond time and history. Not only are they absolutely controlled from all eternity, but God himself enters history from the beginning by his revelation and his prophets and supremely in Jesus Christ, so that history moves, not in terms of nature dates, but historical dates. The old calendar celebrated nature and rights of nature. The new calendar celebrates God's year and the works of men under God. According to St. Paul, men, having been redeemed, are required then to redeem time. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Colossians 4 5. See that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Ephesians 5.15 and 16 The word used for time is kairos in both cases. It means, according to Vine, a season, a time, a period possessed of certain characteristics. Chronos marks quantity, kairos quality. Chronos, time, means duration. Kairos means a particular kind of time, a season or era of some quality or meaning. Redeeming, exagorzero, means to buy up. In Ephesians 5.16 and Colossians 4.5, buying up the opportunity. Way's paraphrase of Ephesians 5.16 is of interest. Grasp at each opportunity, like merchants who eagerly buy up a scarce commodity, for the evil days are on us. Alfred commented on the latter part of this verse. Let it, the opportunity, not pass by, but as merchants carefully looking out for vantages, make it your own, because the days of your time in which you live are evil. On the other hand, the days, times present, are evil. On the other hand, these days must be eagerly redeemed as a season of great value and meaning. The contrast is a dramatic one. Instead of flight from evil days, there is an eager purchase or redemption of them as a time or season of great profit and advantage under God. Now, instead of the days being mere duration, they are a thing of quality to be eagerly purchased. Way's version grasps the sense of the text. The godly man is like a capable merchant who sees and eagerly buys a scarce commodity, in this case time. Time thus is neither a burden nor a nature cycle, but a potential wealth, a pearl of great price whose value is concealed from the ungodly. Time is thus a valuable and scarce commodity. It is a wealth and an opportunity. It is also a promise. For all time points ahead to the Lord of time, and the quality of all time is eternity and God's glorious kingdom. The promises of time are implicit in every moment, and they undergird every hour with their hints and glimpses of fulfilment. 
For this reason, because the godly man's concern is to redeem the time, Christians, and especially Puritans, have been highly conscious of time in the clock. As a valuable commodity, time cannot be wasted. This horror of wasting time is alien to those outside the world of biblical faith. Consciousness of time is, for the ungodly, the consciousness of decay and death. And drunkenness and a sick gaiety are sought to escape from that awareness. Humanists have ridiculed the Puritan work ethic and its supposed slavery to the clock because humanists are in unhappy conflict with time. They want to arrest time by means of a graveyard society and to abolish death because it is a bitter reminder that time passes and the cessation of this hated and fleeting duration is death. Eugen Rosenstock Cousy has called attention to the modern secular version of time which has, we can add, become duration, not a season of opportunity. Moreover, it is either a play duration or a work duration. As a work duration, it is seen as bondage. Quote, the new solar calendar trains man to think of the future not as something new, but as something that can be calculated in advance. Future in this world of economy and technique, is a prolongation of the past. If former civilizations had dared to think of the future as an annex to what we know about the past, a special grammatical form for the future would probably never have been invented. Real future in its proper meaning implies a change in quality, a surprise and a promise. To live in the future means to be indifferent to present hardships. The framework of an industrialized world leaves the cog in the machine in the precincts or antechamber of real life in a prearranged world without a future. The question arises, where is he going to find his future? Rosenstock, who shares the humanist sphere of the machine and work as well as of organized time. He is, however, right in seeing the modern calendar and its philosophy as a desire to have a future which prolongs the past, provided that man can create that past and therefore create the future. The goal is a static society which is wholly man's creation. Time is a problem, an enemy to be captured and chained. The biblical view is different, the Bible, as Henry has noted, Instead of viewing time abstractly as a problem, it regards time as a created sphere in which God's redemptive plan is actualized. For the believer, time is God's appointed area for man's opportunity and fulfillment. Time is man's surest wealth, and when after the floods the length of man's life was drastically curtailed in a few generations, it was both a punishment and an impoverishment of man. When God promises to restore length of time to man's life as the earth is restored to God's rule under man, it is very clearly seen as a great entitlement of man and his new creation. Isaiah 65.20 The psychology of fallen man is thus, again, markedly different from the mind of the redeemed man. Their differing views of time clearly mark their basic differences.